So thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Um, as Alex said, it's been a long time coming. Um, I in initially intended to uh, present something related to this when I was at Harvard and it just took a very long time to finally get here. So I am now a co-founder and a lead ML scientist at uh, Dino Therapeutics. Um, and today I want to give you a primer on model guided biological sequence design. Just a little bit of background uh, on myself. I did my PhD at Harvard with Martin Novak and George Church, where I spent uh, the last couple of years of my PhD thinking about model guided sequence design. I actually started out um, completely on the theory side of an evolutionary biology. And then through George, I met Eric, who you will hear from also today. And uh, he was working on this very interesting problem of trying to use machine learning to design better AAV capsids. And that really um, was a very attractive uh, problem for me uh, for multiple reasons. One was the ML aspect of it, but also because from uh, early in my PhD, I worked on origins of life and working on viruses and fitness landscapes um, sort of tied the original theme of my PhD, which was on a sort of complexity of finding good solutions in biology uh, to the later part, which was an actually applied problem of designing better viral capsids uh, pretty well. Um, the goal of this primer is to give you a high level overview of different approaches that I found interesting from that perspective, from a perspective of a computational biologist who was interested in um, machine learning and evolution at the same time. So um, I won't go into a lot of details for many of the things I will present, but just to like familiarize you with what is available out there. Uh, as uh, Alex said, there is a primer associated with this talk. There's a write-up associated with this that I'm also working on and would welcome any feedback. It's the first version that I've finally managed to send you. Um, but if you have any questions or any uh, things that, that are not clear in the beginning um, in, in the slide, please let me know. So why are we interested in model guided sequence design? It's a very high impact problem. The ability to find good sequences that can do particularly well at some particular thing for therapeutics or in industry applications um, is very valuable. And many of you probably have heard many examples of it. Um, as I said, my own PhD uh, was focused on working to improve the design of a VCAPSID uh, using machine learning. And this is a viral capsid that's sort of the leading candidate for using as a vector for gene therapy. But it currently in the natural form has a lot of drawbacks that we hope to remove. And Eric will talk about that in the main segment today. So I won't go into a lot of deta details, but this figure that you see above is sort of a average map of the effects of single mutations on the capsid. It, here is actually single insertions on the capsid itself, red being uh, positive and um, uh, beneficial and blue being deleterious. So the other question is why now? Um, the main argument from my point of view is opportunity, um, that we can do it. Um, and we can do it in a way that's also intellectually exciting. Uh, so we have developed two technologies in recent years um, that have really changed uh, what's possible. One is that we can directly synthesize variation that we are interested in in high throughput. So we can generate uh, 10 to the 5 even um, more uh, sequences um, in, uh, in, in um, with Agilent or twist chips and then produce them in high throughput and then assay them uh, for the functions that we care about. And the other aspect of it is, well, there's been a lot of progress on machine learning models and we can learn very complex functions using these high capacity models without much um, sort of domain knowledge or feature engineering or stuff like that. So these two have basically come together at the right time to try to attempt this. So what is model guided sequence design? 
Um, there are a few levels to it and I will try to break it down using a picture. Um, so you can imagine a cartoon of a so-called fitness landscape that maps a set of sequences, say protein sequences, uh, here represented by the plane to a function or fitness that's represented by a color. Um, I will denote through the talk as this, um, to this map as phi. Um, and we call this the sort of ground truth uh, oracle. And you can also assume for the purpose of this talk that this map is static. So as you're trying to move along this landscape, um, nothing is changing and uh, the peaks and valleys are staying the same thing. Uh, so it's a, it's a landscape, not a so-called seascape, which is like a frequency dependent dynamics. Um, often in biology, as most of you probably know, this relationship is non-convex and biologists call it epistasis. And the structure is um, dependent on the particular problem you're trying to solve. And the other aspect of it is the sequence space is often very large and in most relevant settings, it cannot be fully measured or it cannot even be enumerated computationally. Um, so what do we do instead in order to access this landscape? We basically try to um, sequence some samples and measure the property of interest. And so this process is what we do through experiments and the main cost, part of the cost is that we want to measure many of these things. So the, the, the like bandwidth of our batch that we can synthesize is one limitation, but the bigger limitation really, um, if you have a lot of money is um, time. So cycling through this process of assaying takes a long time. So you want to really make use of um, the batch that you have generated from that information. So you take these data and then you try to attempt to approximate the ground truth using um, models that you can build so that these can be machine learning models or they can be other types of um, simpler or mechanistic models that you can come up with. And then the final step, which is, I guess, the focus of this talk is you take that approximation. And then the question is, how do I find the sequences that I am interested in? And um, you want to basically explore this space. And that's why we call it call these set of things explorers. You want to explore these, uh, this space to produce high performing sequences. And then you can do this cycle again. So you can propose new samples. Those samples will be experimentally measured. And then you change, you update your model, and then you can do this again. I want to also mention that there, there is somewhat of a tension between sampling such that you learn an accurate map of the entire space and sampling, so which is called like active learning. So you want to improve your model quality and sampling such that you're likely to find quickly a very high performing sequences. So these don't necessarily clash, but um, there is a little bit of tension about this. So if you are more interested in, about learning the structure of the fitness landscape, say um, for a problem like antibiotic resistance, where you want to figure out if the probability of a certain event is high or low, then you might be in the re regime where you're more interested in building an accurate model. If you're in a um, regime that you're trying to make a good therapeutic quickly, um, you're more interested in quickly um, optimizing. This, this is uh, the related to the exploration exploitation trade-off in active learning paradigm, Sam? Is, would you agree um, with that or is it a bit different? It's, it's I mean, you could, it's sort of a two levels of exploration exploitation in my view. Uh, one is that for active learning, you have exploration exploitation, um, but you can also think about active learning versus just optimization as its own exploration exploitation. So um, it dip, I, I think that if you read different papers, it's often conflated. So I'm not trying to draw a very um, strong line here, but, um, the, the trade-off is there, definitely. Like gathering information to build a better, like are you trying to build a better average case performing model or are you trying to build a model that's very good at particular uh, limits of your um, trait? Right. So uh, my name is Larson. I have a question about the same slide too. Yep. Yeah. Um, so 
And the bottom layer here, we have a sequence space and the dimension, dimensionality that might be um, tens or hundreds of bases. And then Definitely. the second layer up is observations. And these are often phenotypes that are just maybe one or two or three continuous values. Can you talk yeah. about how those projections and um, yeah. Yeah, moving down so quickly, how does that affect both these mappings and some of these cycles that you're talking about? Yeah, so I think it's a great question. Um, it's sort of a limitation of this picture. Um, what I am trying to present here is that the sequence space is represented by a 2D surface. It's not obviously not a 2D surface. It's a high dimensional um, uh, space. And the trait that I'm interested in is represented by the color. And so when I show the second layer, the observations, what I mean is the location in that space represents the sequence and the color on it represents the phenotype. So these are the sort of, I have a sequence and I have a map from that sequence to the color, uh, which is the, the phenotype that I'm assaying. And so based on that, I train my model and try to interpolate uh, the third layer. So you are absolutely right that um, this compression doesn't need to be, um, may not be easy or may not be a good compression that you can so easily navigate on. And the picture is not as clean as I try to make it here. Does that answer your question? It does, yeah. I guess we, we draw planes and we picture surfaces because it's it's very hard for most of us to picture a, a high dimensional hypercube. Yeah, and, and I guess part of the point is that there can be bo huge bottlenecks as you're moving from yes. one plane to another, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, so I wanna draw a, a different, uh, before I go further into the weeds, I wanna draw another picture um, that's also again, like a very simplifying problem, but I, again, like, I feel like these abstractions sometimes help understand who is working on what part of these, uh, this, this challenge. Uh, so if you look at what I call the anatomy of an exploration process, um, you often have a bunch of steps that need to happen. So you have a population that exists. Um, you have to start, start somewhere. Um, it might be that it's completely abstract and you're like, oh, I, I can start anywhere on the landscape. That's fine. Um, but you have to start somewhere basically. Um, and then you wanna propose some new sequences and those proposals need to actually become physical sequences so you can like make them. And then there's a step that they get criticized or filtered so that the population in the next steady state is generated. Um, I think if I move to the first example, it will become clear what I mean by all of this. So think of evolution. In nature, the proposal mechanism is mutation and recombination. And the production happens when a variant actually reproduces and say a protein is synthesized. And then the critique is natural selection. So um, natural selection basically takes what you've produced and tells you these work and this doesn't work um, in, in a simplified picture. Um, and also what I wanna note is that there is also an implicit model in evolution that says um, the things that are nearby um, are correlated and the best way of proposing new samples is to stay near the best place you know. So you don't like just make a offspring that's completely different from you because you don't, um, you feel like that's more likely to succeed than something um, that is very close to you. I know this is sort of a too much of a narrative, but the point is that there is some assumption about correlation around uh, where you are. And so in directed evolution, we basically take these knobs on both sides of this production and change it. So we can change the mutation rate, we can force recombination uh, to be uh, more severe and between multiple individuals instead of one in DNA shuffling. And we also steer the selection pressure in a direction that we are interested in. Um, this has been a standard way of doing design um, for many years and it's been very successful. It's won a Nobel Prize. Um, there are some drawbacks to it, in particular, one that I think is useful now is it, it was model free, so it's harder to generalize. Like the lessons you learn from one in terms of like how you steered this to a particular function might not translate readily to another one. 
Um, so, and you have no control over synthesis. So you might actually um, end up losing some of the traits you cared about uh, in the process if you don't assay for them um, as a result of trying to get another trait. So multi uh, objective optimization has its own quirks in directed evolution. It's not impossible, but it, it's not a pleasant thing to do. So model guided design attempts to preempt nature's anger by simulating the process in silico before committing to the expensive syn synthesis step. Um, and so we have a generator, which is a proposal mechanism that produces virtual candidates. And then your approximate model is in charge of critiquing those candidates before you commit to the expensive uh, synthesis. And you can do this multiple times before you actually send, a, send away sequences for synthesis. You might generate stuff, critique them, update your generator, generate new stuff, critique them, and finally end up um, um, passing them on for synthesis. So this is a pattern that you will see a lot in the algorithms that I will mention. Um, before I move on to talk about the explorers, I would like to spend a couple of minutes on models of sequence to phenotype. This is it's by itself an exciting area of research and one slide definitely cannot do justice. Um, but I want to roughly categorize the models into three classes. Um, one is what I will call mathematical and statistical models. Um, and they existed long before we could collect precise data like today. So um, these can be regression models with higher order term like the POTS model um, that includes second order interactions. And to this day, they've been used as also like they're the parameters of them are inferred from real data and they show that they have value in uh, local uh, prediction. But they can also be uh, fully theoretical like the NK model that was used for decades to study evolution. Um, there are also more modern versions. I saw Frank Poelwick was, uh, was in the audience um, who basically generalized these uh, approaches and connect them together um, and get a global picture of the, of the landscape. Um, the second set of models, what I will call computational models are models that try to simulate the behavior using bio, biophysical first principles. So these examples are Vienna RNA and Rosetta. And the final one that's very popular these days is inferred from data, often black box, like a neural network model. And uh, they have very high capacity and especially useful. Um, these models have been especially useful to do stuff like transfer learning of training on the whole protein universe and then trying to uh, fine tune onto a small region of the space based on what's been learned from the general uh, protein space. Each come with certain amount of drawbacks um, and, and positives. So I would say the positives for mathematical models is often they're constructed in a way that they're interpretable. Um, they make sense. Um, the computational models are based on first principles um, and the inferred models are often the ones that are most locally accurate. So if you actually try to like build a model to predict effects of single double mutations and stuff like that, you get the best result with these um, more high capacity uh, inferred models. Uh, and then the drawbacks is mathematical, the, these like classical models are often by design misspecified. Uh, computational models are often coarse grained. So what I mean by that is that they do well in recognizing the general patterns in, um, in the sort of landscape, but it's hard to um, use them to distinguish very small local changes. And inferred models, uh, while they do really well locally, they have uh, out, out of domain pathology. So if you try to stray uh, far away from where they've been trained, they actually perform um, in a way that's unpredictable and you won't have a way of knowing whether you're getting a good answer or a bad answer. A lot of work has been done to ensure that we are um, able to distinguish this, but that's a fundamental like sort of drawback that these models have. But, but um, Sam, it, it, to some extent, it, with, without strong assumptions on these fitness landscapes, that, that's inevitable, right? That, that they're just, you, you just can't know what the function looks like in a region that you haven't explored. I agree. I think the only 
response that I have is that with first principle models, the picture tends to be more consistent globally. So it's like ah. coarse grained everywhere, but like sort of because the physics is mm -hmm. the same everywhere, it's like gets it roughly. And I don't have enough experience to really make it make this claim claim very strongly, but that that's my intuition about it. That um, the same rules are apl being applied no matter where you are in the sequence space. Whereas with these models, it's they can pick up rules that are only locally relevant. That makes sense if your biophysical model is 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 reflecting the yeah. the reality. That thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. I want to talk a little bit about uh, how a good solution um, would look like in optimization. People think about uh, optimality and um, what, I, what I'm trying to depict here, and I'm going one dimension further down in my simplification, uh, just for illustrative purposes, is um, so we have sequences on the x-axis and the y-axis. We assume that we have a one dimensional trait that we want, we're trying to optimize. Um, often, it is not the case that we really want to just maximize a value. We actually care about a particular band of traits um, within a set of many different uh, sort of, um, how did I want to say this? I just want to say that Y is generally high, um, multi-dimensional, not single dimensional. We care about multiple properties of the sequence we're trying to optimize. And also we don't necessarily want to max out every entry in that vector. Um, say like you don't want it to bind to a particular thing too strongly. You want it to bind within a particular band. But I'm again simplifying by saying we're trying to optimize and maximize here. Um, and so one way to measure how well you've done is to see what's the best value you could achieve and then say what is the value that your algorithm achieved based on the samples it made. But oftentimes we actually don't know what the value that we want to achieve is uh, we don't know the rest of the landscape. And so we set a threshold that's acceptable to us. And then we say, if we ex exceed that threshold um, in the actual measurement, we have succeeded. And so we can find a set of sequences that are above that threshold and find that are the set of answers. Um, yeah. Hi, this is Ben. Um, I'm wondering if, if when you're talking about optimality, um, might it be fair to say that really you are going for a peak, but if you haven't, but if you're measuring something, let's say you're measuring binding, maybe the most highly binding sequence isn't the best, but that just means that your assay isn't measuring optimality. Like you're, yeah. if you had an assay that measured as the optimal sequence, what you were exactly looking for, then you would still be looking for the, the, the peak of the, these sequences. So yeah, I think that's an excellent clarification. Um, I just didn't want to conflate optimality with a higher value. Sure. And sometimes that is conflated, but your point is a very good, um, like a better explanation of what I meant than I uh, did. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so like we set usually... You, sorry to... No worries. Could you recap that for... For yeah. the, the rest of us, I, I don't, I, maybe some people caught, I didn't quite understand. So we can transform, I, I think Ben's point is that we can transform our measure in a way that the actual maximal value of that transform corresponds to what we actually look for. So whatever. Does that make sense, Alex? I guess I'm, I was just asking maybe, maybe the optimality is just a poorly designed measurement, right? If, if your assay isn't designed properly to measure the optimal sequence, then, then what you're measuring isn't the peak value. But if you design your, your assay to where you get the maximum value from the, if the maximum value is exactly what you're looking for, then it, then it, um, then you would be looking for that. I don't know. It's a it's a very fine point. It doesn't. I, don't I see. Think it's, 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 so it's related to the, the, the measuring the um, like the readout might not be the exact thing you're trying to optimize. Right. Your readout itself is not optimal. Is what I would be saying. Yeah. Right. right. If you if you optimize for um, desired binding, your assay is fine. If you optimize for maximum binding, your assay is exactly not the same as what you're trying to optimize. Interesting. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so yeah, I just want to say in practice, we often say, okay, I want this to do better than X and better than Y. And, and so we, we look for a bunch of answers using an algorithm and, and the ones that pass that threshold is a set of answers we have found. Uh, one important aspect of design is diversity. Uh, so it's often the case that we assay, um, the assays that we use to design things aren't exactly capturing exactly the point that Ben was making um, what they would um, be doing as the end product. So there might be an instance, for instance, that there are other properties we haven't considered. We're designing a protein as a therapeutic, but it is we are not measuring its toxicity. And so that might disqualify some of the solutions we find later. And for this reason, it's desirable that we generate a diverse set of solutions. Um, and Eric, I think we'll touch on this in the case of AAV. For instance, in case of AAV, we want AAVs that are able to package and transduce different tissues, but they should also be able to avoid uh, immune responses. And so that is something that you might not immediately measure in your assay, but might be a downstream task. So you want to diversify the portfolio, if you will, of the solutions such that it's more likely, you by luck, you're likely to overcome that barrier. Um, Measuring diversity itself can be tricky and I think it's a little bit out of scope for this primer. I will say in practice, it depends on what you're actually, what sort of diversity you actually care about. Um, it can be as simple and crude as like, what is the size of your solution set? And it could be more sophisticated, like what is the pairwise edit distance between your sequences or how many clusters of sequences have you found in some projection of the space? Um, I, I don't think there is a universally good way of doing this, but you, if you read the papers, each of them try to do it in a particular way. Um, I wanna move on to talk about, um, we talked about the solution a little bit. I wanna talk about um, what a good algorithm looks like. And some of these, most of the criteria I'm mentioning here are criteria that exist in literature for online algorithms or heuristic algorithms in different fields. And also come from discussions I've had with people who are actually trying to do this and like what are the things that matter to them. Um, it's not a complete survey, but I think there are, these are qualities of an algorithm that would be helpful to have and you want to pay attention to. Uh, the very first one is efficiency um, and they don't come in order, so it's not a ranked ordered list. I'm just going to go through a laundry list of them. Is that for a fixed um, uh, Y max that you find, how many samples did it take you to reach it? Like, I guess many algorithms can reach it um, for many, many, if you, if you run them for very long, uh, but you want your algorithm to run um, in a reasonable number of batches. And there's another notion associated with efficiency um, that is how, how much computation does your algorithm have to do to produce a, um, sequence for you to test in the batch. So how many queries to the real Oracle do you do and how many queries to your fake Oracle do you do to the to approximate model do you do? And if this ratio is very high, it suggests that you need a lot of compute to generate sequences in your batch. Um, related to this second idea is scalability is like how long does it take you to produce a batch of size B? Uh, what I want to note is that this can be infinite time, say some algorithms might not be able to scale uh, to say batch sizes of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. And so some algorithms don't scale much, but they, they would do a good job if you, if you have them design a very small batch. You can obviously always um, uh, backfill the batch with other stuff, but the point is if your algorithm is making meaningful use of all the sequences that it's been given as allowance to the ground truth query, a ground truth model. And reproducibility, I think, is something that biologists actually tend to care about a lot more than uh, you would you would gather from um, the machine learning papers. And it's that, is it accessible to biologists? Is it sensitive to hyperparameters and implementation? Uh, can I run it and can I use it in lab to generate new sequences? Um, there is a couple of more, and these are more quantitatively studied, especially in online algorithms. We are not in the regime of online algorithms where we can provide some sort of worst case guarantees, but um, 
we are in heuristic algorithms mode, but these concepts are uh, still um, relevant here. One is consistency. One is that if you improve your model quality, does your um, algorithm get better? So the, risk, the answers that your algorithm finds, how do they relate to the quality of the model? If the model becomes closer to the ground truth, does your algorithm can you make use of that information that the model has about the ground truth? The flip side of it is if the model is completely bad, uh, it's not doing anything, is your algorithm robust at all? So would you be completely bust or do you still perform somewhat? Um, and so that's associated with robustness. Um, independence is that slightly more nuanced concept is that is the model sensitive to the bias and errors of a particular uh, oracle? So is the inductive bias or is the type of errors that the oracle produces affect your model? Is Does it affect your explorer? Does it depend on it or can it work with any model? Then finally, it's confusing in concept of evolution. Um, this word comes from parallel computing. The basic idea is what is the penalty associated with batching? So let's say I have a thousand samples to, uh, to uh, attempt in the ground truth landscape. I can do this in one by one. And in that case, every time I sample some sequences, I can update my model and do it again and again. And in this case, I have the maximum amount of information uh, when I go to the thousand sample. The other extreme is that I have to sample all thousand things at once. And so the question is, what is the penalty I pay when I batch things together, depending on how many batches I have? Uh, so that's the concept of adaptivity. And roughly speaking, this is my experience. Obviously, you can disagree, but um, how much people care about these different qualities of an algorithm. Um, and it's relative that is like I've tried to say, worry mostly about what the synthetic biologists think rather than what the ML scientists thinks. It, it's the ratio between them rather than um, whether the, the ML scientists obviously also care about reproducibility. It's not that they don't care about it. Okay, so finally we have arrived at the point of mentioning some algorithms. Um, I've mentioned earlier that's been a flurry of uh, recent activity around the subject. Uh, it's a hot topic. Um, I would roughly put algorithms into three classes that sometimes the boundaries are fuzzy. The first is what I call regularized generative models. These include uh, design by adaptive sampling and conditioning by adaptive sampling for robust design uh, from Brooks and Listgarden and colleagues at Berkeley. Uh, there is feedback GANs from, uh, I think, uh, Gupta and Zhu um, and uh, at Stanford. There is this paper by Killerin et al. that was one of the also early ones that were interesting from Brandon Frey's group. And re more recently, there's been a deep exploration networks from Celix Lab. As a representative, I just mentioned uh, CBAS and DBAS uh, today in a little bit more detail. There is another set of algorithms are, uh, which is the adaptations of explore, exploit algorithms that were repurposed for biological design almost without much change. Um, and the Arnold Lab were pioneers of uh, model-guided uh, protein design, in particular a paper, paper by Romero in 2014 that used Bayesian optimization for protein engineering was very interesting and I think groundbreaking. Um, a more recent approach in this class um, is from, the, from Google, which they used a reinforcement learning design uh, method called Dyna PPO. I will co cover these briefly as well. And then finally, to my knowledge, the oldest approaches to these problems often use genetic algorithms as the exploration strategy. And one of the first few was by Richard Fox in two, 2005. Um, he has had papers before that, and there are other people. Also, the reason I want to mention this JTB paper is because it had a very full picture of what I'm describing to you today back then. Um, so I find it a very interesting paper. And we have also recently revisited genetic algorithm and came up with a very simple variant of the Wright Fisher algorithm and found that it's actually fairly strong still. So it's easy to implement and I think it's it has value as a way of comparing whether more sophisticated algorithms are actually improving in performance over evolutionary algorithm. 
Um, before I dive deeper, I want to mention two things. First, I want to mention that in principle, we don't have to do the optimization in the discrete space. Uh, we can also learn a good transform into a compressed continuous space and then use that space to optimize more easily. It's not necessarily possible, but in some cases it can be. And you can have a good generator that maps back from the from the this embedding into the sequence space again. Uh, one other challenge is sometimes that these transforms that have all these properties are hard to find, but the optimization algorithms that you would use in those cases are more simple. And um, examples of this, um, especially in sequences in um, drug uh, molecule design is the paper by Gomez and Bombarelli um, that they use a variational autoencoder to, to do this. Another reminder is obviously combinatorial optimization is uh, hard, is MP hard. Um, and there's also these additional negative results in some sense. Um, so for instance, the paper by Wolpert in 95 um, essentially stipulates that over the space of all possible objective functions, you cannot have a good universal optimizer. Thankfully, we're not really in that world because we expect biological landscapes to have a high degree of regularity due to physics. But once you like are over that part, the question is what's remaining? Is it actually there is any sort of regularity that you can come up with one algorithm that's just always better than others? But my, my guess is it's probably the answer is no, and you have to do a certain degree of like specialization. Um, but I expect that you can come up with algorithms that consistently do better than random search for any biological design problem. Another um, negative result by Kaznachev is that even um, when you do hill climbing or like say strong selection weak mutation dynamics, uh, even finding local peaks can take an exponential number of steps. Um, so that's another result that I think is interesting. So all I'm trying to say here is that algorithmic guarantees are hard to offer here. And we are looking mostly for empirical performance. So with that, I will go to explaining some of these um, models or explorers. Um, so the first one I, I promised was uh, CBAS, uh, uh, DBAS and CBAS shortly. The basic idea behind this is, uh, so this was by Brooks and Liskarden, they assume you have access to some Oracle phi prime and they really don't, like they don't assume that that Oracle is differentiable or it's basically just a black box Oracle that you can query. And so they're very similar. I'll explain DBAS first. Basically, it's a coming together of a generative model and a cross entropy method. Very high level idea is that you train a generative model on some ground truth examples, then you generate some samples and then you evaluate them with the oracle that you're provided. You set, uh, you pick a set of samples that perform pretty highly and you retrain your generative model based on the score and the uncertainty that the oracle assigned to that score um, to update the par parameters of your generative models, which can be a VAE or a GAN. So the better your oracle is, the better your algorithm. And eventually it basically gets to the sort of steady state of producing sequences that are likely to score highly in the Oracle. Uh, CBAS is very similar, but it's rooted in the concern that if your Oracle is biased um, or has some pathologies that can drive your generator to no man's land um, and generate sequences that are not very good, um, even though, so it can, it can drive you to places that are um, not very good, even though the Oracle thinks they're very good. So CBAS is trying to avoid that problem. And so you start like DBAS. Um, however, your generative model um, is trained, that is trained on the original ground truth data that you have real labels for, is used as a prior to regularize your um, exploration in this landscape. So you wait, reweight. In the steps that you generate sequences, you sort them with the, with the Oracle and you try to re retrain your generative models on them. You also weight them based on how likely those samples are according to the original generative model that 
learn the like sort of prior of what looks like real data. So if your samples start to become less and less like the real data, the, um, the generator basically imposes a penalty on them. And it's less likely to go to places in the landscape that are um, not like the ones that you've already seen. Um, so it sort of restricts the oracle in a, with a soft pessimism implied. And I can go into more details in the lunchtime about this. Um, I'll cover, oh, two things I wanna mention is, so um, DBAS is very consistent because if the Oracle gets better, it starts exploiting it. Um, CBAS on the other hand has the extra advantage of being more robust. Uh, it might lose a little bit of consistency. It might not climb as well if the model gets better because it, it's pessimistic about the model, but um, it's still, is a algorithm that can climb um, even, even with um, models that are not very good. Um, adaptations of explore exploit algorithms. Um, as I said, there is an original paper uh, from Romero et al. in Arnold's group um, using Bayesian optimization. I think most people here, I expect to have seen uh, Bayesian optimization approaches. Um, so I won't go into details of that. I'm happy to go afterwards in questions. Um, but I want to say that the one main drawback of BO approaches is that they are um, hard to scale. Um, the other one that I find interesting um, is the use of reinforcement learning. A lot of people think about reinforcement learning in the concept of sequence design. And I guess the main, uh, this is a paper by Google, the main point I want to make about reinforcement learning is it's often the case that reinforcement learning algorithms that have developed a lot in the recent years um, do well if you have a good simulator uh, that can like help you train your your reinforcement learning agent um, to do the right moves and so Dyna PPO does use this idea that it's like okay we can make a good local simulator how do we do that we make a ensemble of models and we train them on the data that we have and then we evaluate how good those models are and if the models meet some certain threshold of goodness we use them as um, simulators all together uh, to train our policy network and the policy network basically gets to play in this sandbox of models that are uh, good at the local level and then they also have to deal with this problem of, well, the models become less good if you, if you move out. So you have to define a trust region. And the way they do that is by sort of coming up with a heuristic of how much uncertainty there is for a sample between different models. And if the uncertainty goes very high, uh, you exclude that region of the sequence space from what the policy network is trained on. So that's the way of sort of circumventing the um, pathologies that you get from um, these sort of uh, inference models. One challenge is that these sort of reinforcement learning algorithms in particular trust region um, policy optimization approaches are known to be hard to, uh, they're sensitive to implementation, they're rather hard for a biologist to implement, um, and so the reproducibility is still a challenge in my view, unless someone can like release a package that does it very well, uh, regardless of the context. We have found testing them that they're pretty consistent and robust uh, actually, because they use the suit of models that um, generate a lot of um, different ways of training the policy network. Finally, I wanna mention genetic algorithms that is, um, as I mentioned, Fox in 2005, I just want to like um, point out again that he had a very clear vision of this and he did all of the steps in this uh, process uh, back then uh, when it was not really possible to do it in lab. And what I want to say additionally about our own work, and there is a, a already a archive version of this paper out that uh, we tried a very simple greedy algorithm based on the right Fisher process and we found it to be surprisingly good at the metrics, sort of. It was easy to implement, it was robust, and it was consistent, and it was 
good at generating optimal sequences. And I'll mention how we've tested it in a moment. The very basic idea of the algorithm I'm proposing is it just takes samples that are not too far from the very top sample you found. So you take like samples that are within 80% of the performance of the top sequence. So this can be many or it can be very few. So it's not a rank based algorithm. It's more of a how far from the top are you? And then th that population is used as seed to mutate and we establish a trust region for the models to mutate, um, basically roll out sequences and then rank them based on the models. And then you just go uh, to the next round. So it's very greedy, uh, but it tends to actually perform fairly strongly, even in landscapes that are highly epistatic. epistatic. Um, what I want to mention today also is I think it's a very fun area um, and there is a lot of theory to be done there, but there is also a lot of value that comes out of experimental sort of empirical experimentation. So one thing that I started developing uh, a few years ago and over time I've actually with the help of some very um, talented and hardworking students, we managed to like get to the finish line. Obviously it's work in progress and anyone is welcome to um, contribute, but basically to release it into the public domain is this sandbox that helps you basically plug algorithms just like you would do in OpenAI Gym or another reinforcement learning uh, uh, platform and see if your sequence design algorithms can perform well. And it has all these layers that I've mentioned. It simulates uh, the process of designing multiple batches, experimenting them, and then making a model of ground truth. Um, I realize I'm running out of time, so uh, wasn't expected. Alex, how much more time do I have? I just want to know to You can take a few more minutes. Um, I think, like three, uh, yeah, take three, take three or four more minutes, and then we'll take like a, a five minute break before the main talk and start a few minutes after the hour. I, I think that that'll be fine. Right, sounds good. So we have a set of ground truth. These are really not ground truth um, in most cases um, that basically aim to simulate um, the, the experimental sort of ground truth. Uh, the one on the very left is actually a ground truth, is a set of all uh, DNA sequences that they have tested against about 150 um, transcription factor um, factors and um, you have basically the data for 150 different transcription factors and the DNA that um, how strongly they bind to different pieces of DNA and it's a complete landscape but the landscape is fairly small itself so even simple algorithms often succeed in generating very good solutions there is two others and the reason we've picked these two others as I said earlier in the talk is that the sort of rules are consistent across the whole domain and it's not very good one, way, one place and very bad in another place. Obviously those can exist, those pockets can exist, but in, as a general rule, you don't expect them to behave that way. Uh, we have Vienna RNA and Rosetta and a bunch of design challenges in there. Um, on the other side, uh, we also have like models that are trained on local data um, from tape paper, for instance, the BERT-like GFP model that you can try to design a GFP with. That's a problem that uh, multiple papers in this domain have tried to benchmark against. But one purpose of this sandbox is to make it easier to benchmark algorithms. In terms of models, I have two classes of models in this. One is we take the ground truth and we noise corrupt it based on the distance to the sequences that you've already measured. This is a way for you to be able to uh, tune the signal strength of your model in a way that uh, allows you to study whether your your algorithm is sensitive to this or not and be precise about it. We also have the empirical models that you would normally use and also a function to ensemble the models together to, to improve their performance. And um, in fact, our best ensemble is actually somewhere between um, a a perfect model and a model that has a signal strength, if you will, of 0.9. So um, you have pretty good um, um, ability to predict sequences, at least on the RNA landscape that I've depicted here. And so you can also turn the model completely off by setting alpha to zero. And so your algorithm should be confused by that. Um, and you can see how uh, well the algorithm performs. 
I want to show that um, implementing an explorer is as simple as just implementing a single function. And um, so proposed sequences receives a set of measured data, and then it proposes a set of sequences that can um, then be measured against the ground truth, and you can it will update your models and everything, and you can go again. And so the, the interface ensures that you basically stay within the limits of the computational queries and the ground truth queries that um, you want to make. Um, I was going to show you some results, but I feel like uh, we are out of time. So I just want to say that uh, in the Adelaide paper that you can see um, on archive, um, we have some results uh, comparing these algorithms on uh, a set of different tasks. And um, I think this is still work in progress and there is a lot of exciting things to be done. Uh, but the basic point that I'm trying to make is that an algorithm that's very simple to implement uh, can be a very good performer and can also serve as a good benchmark. Um, so with that, I would like to conclude um, just by saying that it's a very impactful topic at the interface of synthetic biology, evolution, and machine learning. Uh, there is a lot of interesting approaches and uh, we introduced some criteria in the sandbox to enable you to make better algorithms. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. I just want to get you excited with this primer. Uh, I also want to thank uh, a few people, especially Eric, who have worked with closely over the years uh, on this problem. People who have contributed to uh, Flex, the fitness um, sandbox, people I talked to at Harvard, and my colleagues at Dino who um, have given me uh, helpful feedback on this. Really happy to be here. So I'm going to share a little bit about the applications of some of the ideas that Sam mentioned. And actually, many of the ideas that Sam talked about came out uh, were inspired by this problem of trying to optimize uh, AV capsids for gene therapy. So these two works really uh, develop side by side. Um, the high level overview of the talk, I'm going to talk a little about in my personal history, how I came to be working on this. Um, and then you know, why our caps is interesting, as well as some of the progress we've made towards making them better for gene therapy, both on the experimental side and then on the model building side, all working within this framework that we call model guided design. Um, it's especially exciting for me to come here and talk at uh, MIA because uh, this project started back in 2015. And one of the first things someone told me about when I started this project was, oh, you should go to the, the MIA talks at the Broad. And so it's, it's been really also fun to see the you know, pr project progress as um, you know, I've seen the community grow around these talks and a real pleasure to come back and to contribute. I'd like to uh, especially thank the many people who helped out for this. This is, I'm gonna kind of breeze through six years of work. Um, and it started in Georgia Church's lab where I was a postdoc uh, working closely with some really great grad students, Pierce Ogden and Nina Jane helped out, especially on the experimental side and been working with Sam on the computational side. Uh, since 2017, we've had a collaboration with Google Accelerated Science, um, Drew Bryant, Ali Bashir, Patrick Riley and Lucy Caldwell on that team. And then since 2018, uh, been continuing to work on this problem, especially focused on translating some of these ideas and technologies towards developing better AV capsids for human gene therapy. And that's all been with the team at Dyna Therapeutics. So kind of personal history and could say the inspiration for why, why do this. Uh, my own career path. Uh, started in physics, where I, I was my undergrad, and then I did my PhD in systems biology. Postdoc was protein engineering, and now as an entrepreneur. Um, I guess I wanted to start this talk by how I was taught to think about proteins, which was that they're very complex, meaning it's difficult to predict how protein folds from first principles, and you know, by extension, then uh, it should be difficult to design a better protein. But that's what I was always taught. But something that uh, was really kind of a fun observation um, as I was getting into biology was two stories that we like to tell ourselves about biology. And they're both very interesting. There's one story, which is that biology is 
um, more complicated than we thought. And that might be some new discovery, some new gene, some new function, and the complexity is growing. And you can tell that story many times. Uh, and then eventually things get very complex. And then there's another interesting story you can tell, which is uh, biology is actually quite simple. And those uh, simplifications can be quite powerful. And it's a perfect kind of academic tool. You can go back and forth between these two things, always kind of moving in opposite directions. Um, so I guess with that story of how proteins are complex, what really inspired me to think about this differently was uh, during my PhD, thinking of how I could kind of apply some of the skills I had learned in physics, I got very interested in fitness landscapes and applying those to biology. And so I actually measured a comprehensive fitness landscape as part of my PhD. This is for a protein INFA in E. coli. Um, and it's a comprehensive landscape, meaning it's every possible single change to the protein, all amino acids, and actually all codons. Um, and this is also measured in a pretty precise way. It's a very accurate measurements. And I, I guess the surprising thing to me was just how regular um, the landscape was and these repeated patterns that you could see at all these different positions. And in fact, it was surprisingly regular to me, kind of the opposite of the complexity that I had expected to see. In part, that might just be because these measurements were quite accurate. So landscapes that I had seen in the past were noisier, which made them seem more complex, but actually um, removing that noise provided a simpler picture. So the obvious way to analyze this was, you know, just to say, well, how simple could it be? Uh, you can do principal component analysis on this, pull out, say, the first four principal components and actually look at those, those okay, explain. Eric, was this, was this a, like a saturation mutagenesis or where you changed it, each single base? Or? It essentially was, um, it was by synthesis. Um, and we just synthesized to generate oligos. And the technique you know, published here in cell systems uh, was called MageSeq. So it used a okay. genome engineering technology. Uh, also the, the George churches I worked on, it was a collaboration with that lab, with Harris Wong. And um, yeah, we used to generate oligos NNN in order to make all possible codons at each position. And then we, in this case, measured the growth rates of the E. coli because it was an essential gene. Okay, and, and what we're seeing is, is each single um, residue substitution. What? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, co collapsing down the different codons to the different amino acids, and then the yeah. color white is you know, neutral, and the dark ones are the deleterious. Um, and then the blacks are the wild type position at each uh, for each right. amino acid. So we're seeing every, every possible sequence that's at, that's at, at substitution distance one from the, the wild type. Correct. So it's a comprehensive distance one fitness landscape. Right. Uh, in this case, for substitutions only. Yeah. Um, so I was talking about the simplicity of it, uh, talking about principal component analysis. Um, first off, th those first four principal components explain about 80, 85% of the variance. They end up being correlated with some basic biochemical properties like the buriedness residues, which tend to be buried or you know, flexibility, steric hindrance, net charge. And they also kind of cluster structurally. You can see the residues that have this kind of buried residue profile um, all tend to occur in this hydrophobic core. Um, whereas things that have to do with charge, those in this case, this INFA protein, uh, it's initiation factor for the ribosome and it binds to the ribosome. So it's the, the positions that are in contact with the RNA that have this um, sensitivity to charge. So I guess what was surprising here was that um, a lot of this made sense. And, you know, I had measured this landscape comprehensively. The thought was that if that's the case, then maybe protein engineering wouldn't be so complicated if we just had enough data, enough data to better understand these landscapes. Because you wouldn't actually have to understand, you know, measure everything comprehensively to get this picture. You could probably subsample that landscape and get a pretty complete view. So in other words, it felt like it was an opportunity here um, to do protein engineering kind of more like a, a Goldilocks problem, not too simple, you know, to be boring, but not too complex to be intractable. It's uh, still hard to design a protein from first principles, but with a reasonable amount of experimental data, we can make pretty good local approximations of those fitness landscapes. And luckily these new high throughput technologies um, like DNA synthesis and DNA sequencing enable you to do um, what are called multiplex experiments. In other words, multiplex just means that you generate a lot of variants and you pool them together and then you measure the fitness in a pool. Um, that enables you to do a lot of experiments in parallel 
Uh, for example, that previous landscape was around 4,000 uh, 4, different mutations. We did another one in that paper that was around 80,000 mutations. Each of those took about a week to do the experiment. Uh, so there's just great power in these new tools uh, to generate huge amounts of data very quickly. And I was very excited by that based upon the mysteries that I felt would be hidden within those landscapes. Um, but actually just using the data itself, that, that's interesting, but the question is, what do you do with that? So to actually make it relevant for both in engineering, I'd like to you know, talk about what's changed now that we have access to that information. And the, the classical um, protein engineering workflow is open loop, meaning you do these serial rounds of mutation followed by enrichment. Um, and in the next round, you do the same thing. For example, if you're mutating randomly, um, not incorporating any of the lessons learned from the previous rounds into the new style of mutation, you are incorporating the improved variants. So there is some uh, leveling up that happens between rounds. But I guess the main point I would say is that, like Sam alluded to, uh, this is a model view process. So um, you're not incorporating any information into the design of the new library. Whereas with a closed loop approach, you could take what you learned from the sequencing and then feed that back, for example, through some model building and then you know, using that model to design a new library. And this closed loop approach has the you know, potential to accelerate the search, meaning that you can apply all the lessons learned from your prior rounds of screening to do a much better job at designing the libraries for future rounds. So I spent the last few years trying to bring the different pieces of this workflow together. Um, I would say what characterizes this machine guided design or you call it model guided design um, is that each of these steps, the uh, library creation, the measurement, often by sequencing, and then the data analysis and the experimental design, those are all automated and high throughput. Um, and it's important to, to say that, you know, I was really excited about machine learning in the, in the beginning to solve this problem of how do you automate the analysis for that work that I did for my PhD. As I said, it was about a week to do the experiment. And in that case, I was under, interested in understanding some of the basic biology of how genes worked in particular, what's the interplay between the RNA landscape and the protein landscape. Um, and I spent about two years analyzing that data set um, that took a week to generate, which just felt like it was going to be too long if you wanted to make a better protein as quickly as possible. And so by using these powerful new computational tools like uh, neural networks, we could automate the design, or automate the analysis, and then using that analysis, automate the design so that you didn't have to wait two years to do your next experiment. You could do that you know, maybe in just another week. And in that way, get the full potential of the new experimental tools which are coming online. So we, we set up to use this. And you know, one of the first things I was thinking in joining George's lab as a postdoc was, where can we have the most impact? What's a really interesting model system to apply these new tools to, both to do exciting new science, but also to have some useful applications. Um, to tie it back to, to Sam's talk previously, these steps here of the machine learning and the library design, those are what define you know, those exploration algorithms, uh, exploration strategies. Uh, so now I'm going to tell you why we ended up working on capsids and give a brief overview of um, gene therapy. There were a few criteria I was looking for in choosing a good model system for this. Uh, wanted it to be impactful. It needed to be hard to do in order to you know, justify the time investment to develop these new approaches, these new technologies. Um, needed to be useful for a variety of applications, not just a one-time thing. If it was just a single problem you wanted to solve, it might be better just to apply the existing technology and to brute force solve it. Um, and it needed to have this capability of being multiplexed, as I mentioned, in order to do these assays in high throughput. So capsids are what we ended up settling on. Um, on the multiplexing side, actually, there's a really natural way in which you can link the DNA sequence to the protein function. And that's because the capsid genomes are packaged within the capsids that they encode. So that provides this coupling in a very simple way, which is already built into the, how the protein works. Um, Every tissue and cell type that you would want to deliver to for gene therapy poses a distinct delivery challenge, but not a completely different challenge, meaning that there's some correlations between these different um, targets. And therefore, you know, all the assays that we would use to target one cell or one organ can be relatively easily adapted to new organs and new cell types, as well as the data itself being valuable for giving you a head start at solving those new problems. 
So there's a lot of benefit from developing a new technology here because you're not just going to use it once, you might be using it, you know, hundreds of times to solve different challenges. Um, in gene therapy, delivery is really the limiting factor. It's essentially what makes the product successful. Um, if you're able to deliver enough DNA to target organ or target cell, because often what we're treating is a genetic disease in which case there's a deficiency, meaning like the natural gene is broken. You know that just adding the, um, the wild type gene to those cells is going to rescue the phenotype, but getting it there is the real challenge. Um, so this has been known for the past you know, 30 years as people have been working to make gene therapy a reality. It's always been a challenge to deliver the DNA efficiently and safely. Um, even in the last 20 years, people have brought a lot of attention to AVs. There hasn't been as much progress as we would like, and that's probably because the capsid itself is a very complex protein. There's 60 different monomers that come together, a lot of conformation or rearrangements that are necessary for the function. And there's also a lot of uncertainty about the biology of AV and how it interacts with the body, for example. So those have been some of the reasons why we haven't made as much progress as we would like, but the impact is there and there's the potential to cure thousands of diseases um, for one. And it also, you know, we believe it's the future of personalized medicine, medicine, which is, you know, better poised to treat many different diseases that aren't possible to treat today. You know, today, many people um, are focused on small molecules and biologics like antibodies, which are inhibiting function. Uh, for many of these genetic deficiencies, there's nothing to inhibit because the gene actually isn't there. Um, by adding that gene in, um, you know, it's a much more powerful way to treat diseases that go beyond just inhibition. And delivery would be a key part of making that, um, that future a reality. So this seemed like a very worthwhile problem to work on. And, and the other lesson I learned from the work I did for my PhD is pretty much no matter what system you choose, it's going to take a similar amount of work to set up the assays and to get all the analysis running. So I really wanted to choose an important problem to work on. That's why I focused on capsids. So to provide us a very simple picture of that, um, gene therapy is essentially these two elements, the DNA payload, typically the gene that's going to replace a natural gene, or in some cases, um, like genome editing, um, the proteins which are going to accomplish a change or actuate a change like a genome surgery. And then there's the vector used to deliver that payload. Um, and I'm focusing on this talk on adeno-associated virus capsids, which are the most popular and probably the most powerful um, way of delivering genes into the body uh, that uh, that's being used today. And it's been used in hundreds of trials, as, as Sam mentioned, um, a lot of potential for improvement, but it, you know, it's, it's pretty good. It's the best thing we have so far. Um, to give you a brief, brief background on the biology of AV, this is what the natural genome looks like. There's a rep gene involved in replication, cap gene, which is the capsid. Um, there's actually three different versions of that cap gene, VP1, 2, and 3, that get translated. There's an alternative <laughs> um, orphan there called AAP, which is called assembly activating protein involved in the assembly of the capsids. Um, and you can see kind of here on the right, the color regions are the variable portions of the capsid. Uh, it's packaged with these inverted terminal repeats at the ends of the genome. To make it useful for gene therapy, you take the viral genes outside of those uh, ITRs and you put in your transgene with a promoter to express it. And in that way, once the transgene is packaged within the capsid, you deliver those capsids to patients and it will um, then deliver the transgene into the patient cells. So that's how AV is used today as a gene therapy vector. Um, the natural capsids are how the field has gotten started and they're good at some things. They can go to some cells and tissues, but there's many, um, many delivery targets which are inaccessible today. So we'd like to make that better. Also AVs today are pretty broad in their tropism. We'd like to make them more specific to only go where they're needed. Um, there's the immune system, which we would like to avoid uh, activating it. There's the packaging size, which is somewhat limited because AVs are one of the smallest uh, viruses. 4.7 KB uh, limit on the packaging size. And there's the manufacturability. Again, it works today because there's clinically approved gene therapies, but could be better. Um, and it's certainly, we don't want to make it worse. So our goal here is really to improve these properties, but also to improve them in combination. Um, the lay of the land is that these natural serotypes are quite distinct in sequence. Whole capsids around 730 um, amino acids in length. 
and between you know, a given two natural variants, there might be hundreds of different mutations. So the sequence landscape is quite fast. However, it's mostly non-functional, meaning if you make even a single change, most of those are going to break the function of the capsid. Some smaller fraction will be neutral and an even smaller portion improved. If then you make a second change, most of the ones that were broken will stay broken. And you kind of get the same ratios as you add in on top of the neutrals and so on. So the kind of big picture view is that the further away you go from natural variant, especially if you're making the changes randomly, uh, the more that library is going to be non-functional. And for that reason, we say that the random libraries are shallow, meaning they only explore the local neighborhood of um, your starting sequence. And they don't come close to exploring this vast sequence space, which is lying between all the natural AVs, and which we believe has the potential to uh, contain these uh, greatly improved capsids for gene therapy. So that kind of leads you to this trade-off where because the random libraries are typically, you know, low quality, the advantage they have is that you can make a large number of random variants, but because the quality is low, that decreases the expected value of finding something interesting within that library. On the flip side, uh, with rational design, you know, either reading the literature or using these, you know, very detailed biophysical models, maybe you can um, predict changes which will be more likely to function in that in other words, that's improving the quality of the library. Uh, but because there's not a lot of things known about AV and still, you know, a lot of basic biology, which we don't know, it's hard to make a large number of good guesses about how to improve an AV. So um, again, that, that's not ideal. And the goal of our work was to say with this more data driven approach, can we be in the top right? Can we both have high quality libraries informed by data uh, and a large number of variants to increase our chance of finding an improved variant. So it's important to the test it in the right system. This goes back to a comment uh, from Ben Deverman in Sam's talk. Um, we want to measure the most relevant thing in this case for applications in human gene therapy. And every gene therapy prior to going to human clinical trials is going to be tested in non-human primates, both for safety, but also hopefully too for ensuring the delivery efficiency. Um, so we wanted to get the most relevant data for ensuring success in humans. And that meant it would be great if we could also do the development of our capsids as well in the non-human primates where they're eventually going to be validated prior to clinical work. And what we found very interesting and exciting was that these new high throughput technologies could make that possible to do cost effectively. Meaning in one animal, if we're testing hundreds of thousands of different variants, now the, um, the barrier to doing these in non-human primates is potentially removed. So first we set up to develop the experimental tools which would make this possible, especially through multiplexing. And we actually, prior to even realizing the importance of exploration strategies, started working on two projects, what we called a wide search and a deep search, which essentially um, lie on the two sides of the coin. The wide search is more about exploration, the deep search more about optimization. Um, starting with the wide search, we began with just a very simple landscape, again, a comprehensive scan, um, testing all possible codon changes. But in this case, it was done also through synthesis. So we did the substitutions as well as insertions and deletions and also replicates of each variant, which made it around 200,000 different um, variants and barcodes that were tested uh, as part of this library. This is kind of giving you a high level view of how those were assembled, the mutations to scan across the caps of gene. There's a barcode that we can use and just sequencing from the barcodes, we can know which mutation we're looking at. And then this was all enclosed within the, the AV genome, those ITRs at the end, which package it within the capsid. Uh, so we developed the ability to measure each of those different properties, uh, measuring the library just to QC it, adding that to cells to produce the uh, virus particles, purifying those. And then by sequencing each of these different steps, looking at the ratio, that gives you a measurement of the fitness. From the virus library, then you can go into the animals, and then from the animals, you can go into, uh, for example, the different organs, and in that way, characterize the in vivo delivery properties of the capsids. Here's showing you an example um, of the first library that we built, which is on the AV2 serotype, and it's a section of the capsid. This is the production assay, meaning what's the fitness of every variant as you go from the DNA library and produce uh, the encapsulated file genomes. So on the right is showing you, again, another picture of that fitness landscape. The whites 
uh, are neutral, uh, same as the wild type in efficiency for production. Blue is deleterious and the red is beneficial. Black dart marks the wild type. And you can see in the rows, those are all the different codons. Uh, the black lines separate amino acid blocks and the X is the different positions within the capsid. So uh, you can also see within here, there's a number of controls. For example, all the stop codons down at the bottom, those we, we put in because we expect those to be deleterious. So we wanna see that they have a negative uh, effect, which is true. Also, you can say that all the synonymous codons are replicates of the same amino acid. If the amino acid is what's driving the function then those should be replicates as well. And so you can see that, you know, those blocks roughly align with the amino acids. And this is also averaging the function across two replicate barcodes. So we built this library, one, because it's a good way to, you know, build an intuition for whether it's working or not. And because it was relatively straightforward to analyze this data. This is just a section of the capsid. Zoom out and just so, average. Quick, quick questions, Eric. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what can you say again? What the black dots are? The black dot is the wild type codon at each position. Oh, right. Thanks. And then uh, the the other one is from the audience. Um, not all stop codons are bad. Then. Um, so they're all blue. So they all are worse than oh, wild yeah, type. They all are There's bad. some noise, and that's actually why this. This presentation is quite nice because you can see, you know, the speckles in the, the matrix, that's probably just experimental noise and it arises for a number of reasons. One is that not every variant when it's produced in this pooled format has the same uh, abundance within the library. So some are less frequently um, present and then those because you're in the end measuring the frequency through sequencing the ones that are at lower abundances, um, you have fewer counts of those, which means you have more noise in the measurement. So there is noise here. Um, you can say like 99.9% .9 of the library is present, but there's a few things that are missing. You know, for example, this, this little speckle here, that's probably just um, a very noisy data point rather than actually being a difference in that code. Um, that's my intuition from looking at a lot of these heat maps. But, you know, you can actually, of course, peer into the data more carefully to separate those two effects. And Great. there is, you know, so I guess what we're looking for is in general, a, a deleterious stripe down here on the stop codons. Um, we're looking for, for example, with the wild type that the wild type synonymous codons are similar um, fitness. And that's how we normalize everything to, to zero for the wild type. We're also looking for this kind of block structure across the similar codons for the same amino acid, because that tells you that we're measuring something at the protein level. Um, there were a number of tricks to make this work too. You know, for example, you want to make sure that you're producing a small number or ideally one capsid per cell. Otherwise you run into problems with the capsids actually being chimeric or with the capsid cross packaging a different genome. Um, but if you optimize the conditions for producing the library, then you can get uh, a picture like we show here. Um, and just same, same picture again, this is zooming out and now averaging across the amino acids and looking at um, just that same section. And then this is kind of showing you the whole data set for the substitutions on the top and then the insertions down below uh, all across all positions, one through 735 for AV2. Um, and again, these were all synthesized and then pooled together and produced and then read out from a single NGS um, pool. So in this case, it's around 30,000 different amino acid changes. It was just over 90,000 codon changes. And then there were multiple replicates that were built into that. So um, very powerful approach. And this was really exciting to see. And it confirms a few of the intuition that we had about this. One of them I already talked about was that the, um, if you look at this again, blue is deleterious. The matrix is mostly blue, which means most of the changes what are going to break it. For what? I think someone's someone's off mute um D during the brief interruption i have a question oh yeah go ahead um how many cells do you think are getting infected here and in particular like how many cells per variant are being assayed and i, I saw in your graphic briefly that it looks like you're measuring fitness across different tissues so i guess the same question applies in each of the tissues how many cells do you think you're getting per per variant that's a really good question. They probably have different answers. Um, this was produced 
with a very large number of cells. I'm, I actually don't know off the top of my head what the exact number would be. It was 40, I guess, each, each of these, there were done two replicates and each was about 40, um, 15 centimeter plates, which is probably like in the billions of cells, um, if not close. And the library is, you know, hundreds of thousands. So many more cells than variants um, so that you can get kind of essentially internal averaging of the function, no matter which cell um, a particular uh, plasma went into. On the other side, when we go in vivo, then it's, it's a different story because some organs maybe are you know, more efficiently delivered to, and you can measure the variance many times. In other cases, for the more challenging organs, you might be sparsely sampling the library and you know, even in some cases recovering 1,000 or 10,000 different sequences. You know, in that case, they probably each came from a, a single cell because there were, again, millions of cells in that small tissue sample. Um, so it really depends what organ you're going into. And although we didn't get to that level of kind of analysis in the, the paper that was published here in Science, at Dyna, we've done a lot of work to try to build tools that help us to understand the copy number of um, you know, variants, for example, that are being expressed within a given cell uh, using kind of additional barcode IDs that are built on to the barcodes, which also represent the different mutations, uh, if that answers your question. Uh, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things you can learn from this. Not all of them we learned from this the single experiment. I, I guess. actually had a related question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when you, you mentioned tuning to avoid caps and mosaicism for that, um, for production, how do the transfection ratios you, or the amount of DNA you're using for transfection compared to what's typical for AAV production? Are you pretty close or are you kind of scaling it down to deal with the mosaicism problems? We scale it down. Um, and that's actually the first experiment we did prior to even building this library was to do a small section of the capsid and then you know, test 1x, 10-fold less, 100-fold less, 1,000-fold less to figure out where do we get the um, you know, the coupling between the genomes and the function. Um, and you, you start to see that even at 10x less. Um, typically, it's somewhere between 10 and 100x is where, you know, people are using these days. If you go too low, you, you actually may produce much less of the vector, which you run to this problem that was just mentioned about the number of cells that you've transfected might become much lower. Mm -hmm. um, and you also just have less of the vector to use in your future experiments. So you, you try to move it down towards the limit of one capsid per cell um, or one, one plasmid per cell, but it's not necessary that you do that. You can still observe these things and then you can kind of look at your dynamic range by looking at how much of the stock codons fall out of your assay. In this case, the stock codons are deleterious. They shouldn't form any viable capsids, but we see about a 30 fold depletion of them. So there is some cross packaging going on, but it's something that we, we actually measure and uh, calibrate against. So you can, you know, even if this is happening at some low frequency, it's not the end of the world, um, as long as you're keeping track of what's happening, uh, what's going on. Great, thanks. Yeah, and so that, that's also why we have these, you know, negative controls built into the library, as well as the positive controls, which are replicates of the wild type, so that you can normalize everything to that, uh, that scale. Um, this is just taking the average across each position for the substitutions and the insertions and plotting that on top of the 3D crystal structure. And you can see these striking patterns, not only between inside and outside of the capsid, but also the differences that are evident between insertions and substitutions. So it, it kind of gets to the, the point of structure has been a guide to our engineering efforts. And that's one way of putting information into the design. But was, what was really exciting here was that even from a single experiment, we can learn so much about the structure, which is captured visually here but actually much more information is present within the library. Not only do we have the average at every position, but we know, you know for every codon or even amino acid, um, the fitness of those individual variants, as well as there's differences, you know, for example, here on the insertions, you can see in the five-fold axis, it looks very different than the three-fold axis, which is red here. Um, those things wouldn't be as obvious just from looking at the structure, but we can learn that from the data. So we, we feel that the data is more primary uh, more useful for how we would design a better library. Um, there's some vignettes that I don't think I'll have time to go into totally, but one really interesting thing that we found here in doing the systematic scan, there's you know three genes on the AV genome. We were focused on this library for the capsid gene. 
there's an out of frame gene um, in the, the second reading frame AAP, which was known, so three genes in total. And actually, when you do this systematic codon scan, one thing that really popped out was this weird pattern of changes within amino acid blocks, uh, which after some more detailed study uh, ended up being a new gene that we called uh, membrane associated accessory protein, MAPE. Um, and it just kind of pops out of the data. It was really surprising and exciting. There's still a lot of things we don't know about its function. One thing which is surprising is, is that it's in the membrane, whereas AV typically is assembling in the nucleus or even the nucleolus. So the natural biology of what MAPE does and how it relates to the AV life cycle is still something that we and others uh, would like would love to know. And maybe there would be applications to uh, for this protein for gene therapy, but that's still to be determined. Um, I'm going to talk more about the application side. So, you know, taking data like I just showed you, taking those tools and now trying to build models of the landscape uh, leads us to want to explore that deep space, which as, as Sam said is vast. You can't test them all, you can't even enumerate all the different possible variants. So we needed some efficient way of exploring. Um, and our thought was to use machine learning models to direct us where we should go. You know, which combinations of mutations would be most likely to be valuable for testing. This is a kind of just a visual of what that looks like. So in other words, the center of this is the starting sequence. What we tested in the previous um, section, that was just the first ring, all the single mutations. And now, you know, here is two, three, four, and so on, actually all the way up to 40 total different mutations that were tested as part of this next round. The question was, how far can we go? In this case, it's again, coloring it by the production. You can see you can go pretty far. Um, one thing I'd like to say to motivate this is, is why do you want to make a large number of changes to the AV capstan? And a big reason for that is because of pre-existing immunity, one of those properties we'd like to improve about AV. Um, so to explain that, I want to talk about neutralizing antibodies, which of course, that's what you would get anytime your body sees a viral infection. Um, if you look at different people's serum, um, you can do an assay called a neutralizing antibody assay by doing dilutions of the serum. Uh, in many cases, people will have antibodies against AV, which is called pre-existing immunity, and they'll have different titers that you can measure with this assay. If you look at where those antibodies are binding, for example, here with cryo-EM, they're distributed all across the surface of the capsid. If you look at the natural serotypes, most patients, um, will be immune or have some degree of pre-existing immunity, anywhere from 20 to 80% of patients for a given serotype. And actually, as part of clinical trials today, many of them have these exclusion criteria where patients with neutralizing antibodies against um, that product serotype won't actually be eligible for the therapy, or even if they were eligible, may not benefit uh, from the treatment. So that's a major challenge, which we would like to overcome. But because the antibodies is on the left, you can see bind all across the surface. And if you look at that surface, the colored regions here on the right, those are the variable regions. The black are the more conserved regions. If we want to block the antibodies from binding, that's going to require changing a very large number of positions all across the surface. And that's a very hard thing to do, as I told you, because most of the changes you'd want to make if you chose them randomly would be deleterious. But the upside could be that if we make enough changes in other words, to remove all the natural epitopes from the capsid, um, making it not, no longer really look like a natural capsid, but um, as a synthetic capsid, something the immune system has never seen, then it could be a universal vector that every patient could uh, be treated with for a gene therapy. So that's a major goal of the field. We set out to test how far away from a natural capsid we could explore using the information um, from the experiments like I just showed you. In this case, we chose a representative region of the AV2 capsid. Uh, a portion of it was buried and highly conserved, other portions exposed at the surface or at the interfaces between monomers shown here on the structure. Um, we took the data from that previous experiment, the wide search, all the single mutations, and did a very simple, you could say, exploration strategy. We preferentially chose the positions which had higher fitness, either um, for the different tissues we were thinking of optimizing, or you could also do the same thing with production. Based upon the fitness, there was a probability of choosing a variant and sampling it, you know, as the first, second, and third mutation you'd want to introduce. And this way, um, 
kind of building a, a library of design variants informed by data, which were less likely to be broken. So a very simple strategy here, again, using data only from the single mutations. So essentially an additive uh, fitness model. We then measured the ability for those capsids to go into different organs. Here was going into the liver. And so you have the random mutants in the bottom there. Those are not going anywhere. In many cases, they're not actually even assembling and packaging. Um, so those are in the gray. And then on the, the orange, those are the design variants. And if you threshold that, say at the wild type level at zero, you get some picture like this. As you make more steps away from the wild type, the random mutations fall off very quickly. That's again, matching the intuition I mentioned previously, the design mutants are able to go much further away. In this case, about five to 10 before it finally drops off. So a question was, you know, that was a very simple model. And also now we also have more data on the you know, deeper exploration. Can we train uh, models which will enable us to explore even further away? And also what's the um, you know, right combination of type of training data and type of model? Here I'm going to show you some results for the types of models. We were interested in knowing how complex did they need to be. So we tested a very simple model, again, logistic regression, as well as some of the more um, the higher capacity neural networks like a CNN or an RNN on that data. Um, as benchmarks, a few things to show here. So one is the, the black line is the variants which are generated randomly. How well are those producing? In other words, this is a packaging assay. Um, the whole library that we designed using that very simple additive model from the singles data, that's shown in the gray. Um, and then the average diversity of the natural serotypes within this region, shown here as mu, that's around 12 mutations. The whole region is uh, 28 amino acids in length. So now plotting on top of this, the uh, results from, um, we took the data from the previous experiment. We then trained the models on that. We designed new variants, and then we went out to test those. Um, in other words, to validate whether the models were able to predict whether more synthetic variants uh, were viable for production. And so here's showing you uh, those results. Um, the lit logistic regression is slightly improved relative to the additive model, which you could say it just means that we've learned essentially the right thresholds from that data in order to um, know which changes are likely to work and which ones aren't. And it's also, you know, the original additive model was trained on the singles data. This logistic model is trained on that plus a little bit more data. So uh, the differences between those are not directly comparable, but the differences between the logistic regression and the CNN and the RDN, that's where it's more interesting in that um, the neural network models are able to explore further away from the starting sequence and also to surpass the diversity of the natural AVs by, um, you know, in this case, a few standard deviations. So this is a very, um, just an exploration into the sequence space. I could talk about it more if we have time, but another thing that we noticed was that the neural networks tend to be more robust to the type of training data, meaning they have similar performance with a lot more data and also a lot less data, which is also exciting and potentially means that some sort of more uh, compressed sensing approach to sampling of the data would, would still be viable. So, uh, finally, putting it all together, talking a little about what we've done since these works. Um, these are both experiments that were done at Harvard. Uh, so we, we started the company um, to do this and primarily because we wanted to, to maximize the impact. Uh, so that was done at the end of 2018. And we really wanted to solve this problem and to solve it in a way that was going to be translatable to human gene therapies. And the company seemed like the, the fastest and uh, best way to do that. So a few things we've been focusing on since um, that work, which was published in Science last year, uh, translation from mouse to NHP. Um, also measuring not just the in vivo biodistribution, but also the transduction, meaning the expression of the viral genomes within the target organs. Uh, partnering with uh, leaders in industry. And in, in this case, Dino has signed partnerships with Novartis for AVs in the eye and Sarepta uh, for AV gene therapies in the muscle. Uh, where Dyna develops the capsids and our partners are responsible for the clinical development and um, eventual sales of those products. So that's a great way for us to uh, work together to increase our impact on uh, helping gene therapy patients. Uh, we've done a lot of work developing and improving the technologies for the libraries, 
longer assemblies. I already alluded to this single molecule ID tracking, longer in sequencing, um, as well as advancing the measurements, the assays for things like packaging size, uh, avoiding neutralizing antibodies, tropism, even with single cell resolution, and building up the computational infrastructure. Um, so on the experimental side, you know, we now do the same types of comprehensive scans, but we also do that by incorporating information from uh, other publicly available sequences like the phylogeny of AV, as well as the structures uh, of AVs and related viruses, as well as actually now, because we have done this several times on other therapeutically relevant serotypes, we have all that data, which is a head start in terms of wanting to build a library for new serotypes. So we incorporate that to the design as well. Uh, here's just a snapshot of this workflow too, the infrastructure we have for machine learning. And it, it just shows you in practice how the you know, the ideas that Sam talked about are implemented. We, we take the data in either public data or our own experimental data. You might featureize that or transform it. There was, you know, great questions in the chat about transformations to continuous spaces. Those are possible. Train a variety of models on that. Uh, I've talked about in this talk, primarily the classification models, you know, viable or inviable for production, but you can also do regression models, for example, on the efficiency of delivery into target organ like the CMS. Uh, from those models then to do this iterative optimization that's what sam mentioned as this kind of in silico experiments um, trying to design the best variants those um, models or even exploration strategies can be all uh, prototyped in this testing sandbox that that sam mentioned uh, flexus which has just been released and then from those um, you know in silico explorations we design a portfolio of sequences come up with some way of balancing that portfolio across, you know, the expected value of a beneficial sequence as well as minimizing the risk or at least diversifying the risks. And that turns into an order of oligos, which then goes into the next library. Um, here's just a snapshot again of what we've done uh, more recently. Same view as I showed you before. Um, the blue are all the variants that we've designed in our libraries, you know, anywhere from zero to 50 changes away from uh, the starting sequence. There's some step down, only a fraction of those are uh, assembling and packaging the genomes, that's in the orange. And then again, I talked about, we, we then go one step further from just measuring the DNA of the genomes in vivo, either in cell culture or in, in animals, we wanna measure the expression of the vector. And so that's uh, uh, an assay to read out on transducing. And again, there's not all viruses which package are gonna be uh, viable producers. So there's another step down for that as well. So this is showing the progress we've made so far towards the synthetic AVs. And at some point, we'll, we'll probably stop calling it AV because it won't will no longer you know, look like an AV. It'll be as different from AV as other viruses are from AV. So that's just kind of the beyond AV region. Uh, so to summarize, we have all these different information sources available today, lots of known public information, sequences and structures, as well as information we can generate ourselves using these high throughput experiments. We can train models on that. And then um, those measured data are like, you know, specific points that we've surveyed in the landscape. With machine learning, we can build models which infer the landscape at all the regions in between. And then guided by those models, we can navigate to what we believe are the optimized variants at the peaks of those landscapes and then test those in further experiments. So in terms of future directions, Sam already said this is a really exciting field. A lot of great work is going on. Um, for gene therapy, we still have these goals. We want to you know, solve all these and do that with capsids that optimize across multiple properties simultaneously. So, you know, us and many in the field, um, we want to have the best in class capsids that are most impactful across a variety of capsid profiles. In other words, the capsid profile is some combination of the different properties, which is going to make it an ideal capsid for treating a given disease. Uh, that can be both single organ and multi-organ targeting, as well as even at the level of cell types, AV specifically targeted to uh, individual cell types. Uh, there's going beyond AVs towards synthetic capsids, which has the potential to generate universal vectors, which can treat every patient, and also, you know, vectors which are um, immuno-inert, meaning that the immune system doesn't react against them. Uh, that would be ideal for the purposes of, for example, redosing of uh, gene therapies. Of course, we always want more data. That is gonna to lead to better models. Uh, we want higher quality data, 
Again, same goal. Um, we do the work in non-human primates because it's the best assay we have today, which is going to, you know, enable us to have confidence going into human clinical studies. But it would be nice if we didn't have to do so many primate experiments, or if we had new sources for non-NHP data, which could be used as good proxies for predicting what would happen in a primate or in a human. Um, so those are, I think, there's a lot of potential for that, and it's something that we're, you know, quite interested in exploring uh, now at Dino. And then, of course, there's the extension of these same approaches. There's, there's nothing, I would say, particularly unique about these and their ability to solve problems for AV. They could be expanded to other things that are relevant for gene therapy, like payloads and manufacturing, as well as really any bioengineering, uh, genetic engineering problem uh, for proteins outside of capsids. And you know, us and others, of course, are very excited about that potential future. So just to recap uh, this talk on capsids, uh, Natural AVs enable today's gene therapies and um, have been successful at treating a small number of diseases, but there's great room for improvement uh, to make them better technologies for in vivo gene delivery. That's challenging if you build your libraries randomly because most of the space is non-functional, uh, but these new methods enable us to generate huge amounts of data uh, quite rapidly. And Machine learning models trained on that data can build these maps of the captive fitness landscape. Those maps uh, then enable this model guided exploration. For example, enabling the diversification of AVs away from the natural serotypes, as well as optimization for all the other properties that are important for a gene therapy. Uh, and in the future, we, uh, we strongly believe that this type of workflow will be quite valuable for um, making gene therapy even more uh, powerful and able to benefit all patients, uh, to be useful for treating diseases of new organs, and even to move beyond treating rare diseases by making the therapies more effective, you know, easier to manufacture, um, cheaper to manufacture, so that they can be used to treat larger patient populations. It's something that could actually become a more mainstream gene therapy if, uh, if we all work together to make that possible. And I'd like to thank um, you know, everyone who contributed to this work, especially um, our team at Dino Therapeutics. This is my email in case anyone wants to reach out. I'm happy to take any questions now uh, as well.